Thank you very much. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, uh, and, uh, it's thank you for inviting me to in this uh, beautiful place. It's not too loud, right? Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, so many years ago. So let's see if I can make this computer work. Um, let's see. So was was it was it was it? No, it's not this one. So many years ago, but oh, oops, oh, yeah. I was trying to send that. Can I? Yeah. About the time I met Jan, actually, which was about 25 years ago. So we were playing with things like that, robotic catching, and the. Um, we, we, by the time we were done, we were pretty good at it. Uh, it was actually pretty hard for the robot not, not to catch a ball. Uh, and again, you know, this is mostly for the dates, about 25 years ago. Uh, but we also uh, realized we would have to get a little organized if we wanted to develop a basketball player or something like that, which actually we had no intention of doing. Uh, because even getting this to work reliably on lots of objects and so on requi required about 100,000 lines of code at the time. <laughs> And so we, we figured out we wanted to get a little organized. And so we uh <coughs> so of course the, the usual place to, to look for uh, ideas is, is nature, right? And if you think about the, the brain, it has about uh, 10 to the 11 neuron and uh, with about 10 to the fourth connection per neurons. So these are big numbers, of course. Uh, they have a number of uh, implications. First of all, since you know this is a uh, this is a, um, a workshop which has to do a lot with graphs, you know, it means it's a very sparse graph, right? Because you have 10 to the 11 node and only 10 to the fourth connections. Okay, so it's extremely sparse graph. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that you know if you take this 10 to the 15 connection and do a little a very quick calculation, it means that from the time a baby is born to the time she goes to college, she creates about a million new connections per second. Okay. So uh, this is just a règle de trois, right? So if you just uh, if, if you just compute that, uh, so you have about a million new connections per second, and of course it's much more than that because actually there's lots of pruning. Okay. Uh, so in a sense, you have this very big dynamic system uh, with lots of feedback and so on, an extremely active system. And uh, another number, by the way, is that it's using 20 watts, right? It's using 20 watts. It's not using a, a power plant or it's not using a, a dam or whatever to, to do its computations. It's using 20 watts, okay? Uh, and the other number is that it's doing all these things which we now are trying to reproduce and perhaps uh, excel with uh, deep learning and other things uh, with hardware which is de desperately slow, right? Uh, a neuron works about 10 million times slower than a transistor, right? It's saying, so, you know, budget cuts, suddenly you have your hardware is 10 million times slower. Have a good day, right? So but it's exactly what the, what the brain is doing, right? It's doing this desperately slow hardware. Uh, so, the one of the main properties, of course, that uh, you know uh, brains and uh, biological systems have is that they are the result of evolution, and evolution is something that works by piling up things that work. Okay, both through evolution and through development. And so, uh, you have this in uh, emotional response. I'll go this very quickly. You have this in uh, in the immune system, right? You have uh, innate immunity, which is old and uh, fast, and you have adaptive immunity, which you know. Uh, the basis of vaccination and so on, which is uh, much slower and involves some kinds of memory, right? So it's actually a very cognitive thing if you think of the immune system. Uh, similarly, if you think of uh, motion control, uh, the uh, invertebrates, at least, or at least in some classes of vertebrates, motions uh, are obtained by combining elementary force fields, okay? And just a few of them. Okay, so I won't get into the detail of that, but basically you have motor primitives and the motor synergies and you combine uh, just a few of them to get all of the motions, you know, so in the case of the leg of the frog, about just four motor synergies. So in the brains, there's a lot of feedback also, you know, in the sense uh, a lot of what we see today in, uh, in learning systems is, uh, is very much, uh, at least in real time, is very much feedforward. So a lot of feedback, as, as we know, actually, so this is a very, this is kind of an old drawing, but... 
Uh, there's millions of connections feeding back from the cortex to inner nuclei uh, uh, to the thalamus. So the thalamus is the place uh, in the brain where all the information that eventually reaches the cortex has to go through, all the sensory information, except for smell, uh, because smell is a very old sense. You know, bacteria, you smell to go up uh, chemical gradients. So, uh, but apart from smell, all sensory information that reaches the brain uh, eventually has to go for the thalamus. Okay. Uh, so on top of this drawing, I put two more recent uh, informations, uh, one from Sherman and Guillory and uh, one from uh, uh, Rodney Douglas and a uh, group in, uh, in Zurich. Uh, if you look at just the connectivity of, th of the thalamus, right, uh, and you look at uh, the anatomy of the thalamus, if you, want, if you look at the number of connections, the connections that come from the senses are only 5%, okay, so the data is very sparse, okay? And similarly, if you take, uh, if you take uh, uh, a neuron in the cortex, most of the information that comes to it is from neighboring neurons, very little from the thalamus, okay? So in other words, you have this huge dynamic system, okay? But the input is very, very sparse, okay? And by the time it arrives to the cortex, it's really sparse, okay? And so it's a little as if the natural state of the brain was something like dreaming, and from time to time you constrain it with very sparse reality, right? But the, 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 the whole dynamics is, is this entire dynamics is, uh, is there whether you constrain it with reality or not. Okay. Uh, and of course, in genetics, you have similar things, right? I mean, you, uh, as you know, 98% or so of the human genome does not directly encode protein sequence, and a lot of that doesn't encode is used precisely for regulation and control. Okay. Similarly, we have all of these beautiful and very powerful mathematical techniques and wavelets and so on, uh, which are used all the time on the internet and uh, other places to, uh, to transfer data. Uh, still, at least last I checked, uh, there is no known computer algorithm that can reliably pick up you know, listen to a jazz quartet and extract the trumpet, okay? It seems reasonably easy, right? But, you know, any two-year-old child can do that, okay, if you t once you told her what the trumpet is, right? She can sing the trumpet, right? But there's no computer algorithm that can do that at the moment. Uh, you know, uh, people are trying, but, but may this may have, a, again, a lot to do with the fact that, you know, the auditory system is, is not this kind of hierarchy and so on. It's, it's a very strongly uh, feedback-connected structure. Uh, similarly, of course, we, this is a long introduction, just to, to uh, not to do only math. Uh, so, uh, similarly, uh, the brain uses a lot of prediction, right, uh, largely because, well, one of the reasons is that it uh, is dealing with these uh, uh, desperately slow components. So, of course, you know, it's doing prediction and catching, uh, as uh, our robots uh, did, right? But, you know, it's, of course, doing prediction and crossing the street, because uh, presumably you do that differently in Paris and in London, or you should. Uh, uh, you, your mother may have told you that, you know, it's important to wake up at regular hours. You know, she may not have known why, but it's because uh, years before you wake up, your brain starts preparing your body for waking up, okay, and that starts hours before. And if you keep changing the hours you wake up, after a while your brain realizes you're not worth it. Um, similarly, uh, conditioning, right? Uh, all of conditioning is based on prediction, right? Uh, the placebo effect, right? 42% uh, effectiveness of sugar pill as compared to real, uh, so-called real drug, unless there's something really magical about sugar, you know, something that should be st uh, studied much more, you know, 42%, right, or something like that, right, effectiveness, right. Wagner operas, I don't have time to talk about, I'll be happy to answer questions about, uh, uh, and uh, illusions, okay, uh, illusions are also a reflection of the fact is the brain is, is dealing with very quick uh, mechanisms to do prediction, and sometimes you can fool them, but in a sense it's a feature, okay? And some people have been working on uh, illusions to try and understand the brain. Uh, uh, one of uh, my favorite uh, such illusions from my colleague Ted Adelson at, at MIT, right? Uh, anybody looking at this picture uh, will think of this as a, as a gray square and this as a, as a white square, right? But of course, if you, if you uh, Photoshop this and just get rid of everything but A and B, uh, you'll find out they're exactly the same, okay? 
And that's because your brain is making all these assumptions about what's going on in the scene, right? Uh, and so uh, you interpret this perfectly as A gray and B white, but of course they're not, okay? And it's a feature, right? Because nobody said that the brain should be a photon detector. The brain is meant to interpret scenes, okay? Uh, so it's a feature, okay. Uh, of course, synchronization is also something which is used everywhere in the brain. Coincident detection, mirror neurons, uh, uh, binding, and so we'll come back a little to that. And uh, you're probably all familiar with these kind of pictures, right, which are still pictures but can make a lot of people sick, actually. Uh, and that's, you know, it's kind of a reflection that your visual system and, and the brain is a dynamic system, okay. And so you're seeing all these things moving when none are. So let's get more into the math, if I may say. You know, this is not uh, profound math as compared to a lot of what's done here. It's uh, rather simple things. Uh, so we need to, we, we're interested in building theories that allow to deal reasonably simply with questions of nonlinear dynamics behavior, simple nonlinear dynamics behaviors, the effect of feedback, and in particular the idea of being able to pile up things that work and still have something that work. Okay. So uh, we, we d um, there is something in, uh, in control uh, in dynamic systems, of course, very well known, which is Lyapunov theory, and Lyapunov theory is, is a sort of virtual physics, but more precisely a sort of virtual mechanics. Okay. And uh, I had at some point this extremely brilliant student, Winnie Lohmiller, who came uh, to, to work uh, uh, with me. And uh, we, we started wondering whether instead of doing virtual mechanics, we could do something like virtual fluids. Okay? Uh, and we ended up with uh, what we call contraction theory, which turned out to have uh, a lot of uh, past history in various forms. But uh, let me uh, pl explain, present it to you the way uh, we, we played with it. Okay. So, uh, we need a f definition of stability, right? We have this nonlinear dynamic system. Time derivative of the state x is equal to some function, nonlinear function of the state and time. Here we assume ODEs. We could do that with PDEs as well to some extent. We're wondering, where by definition, we'll say the system is contracting is any two solutions converge exponentially. In other words, if you start with any two arbitrary conditions in this nonlinear system, they'll end up doing the same thing. Exponentially, okay. What? Uh, the same thing. We all end up doing the same thing. Uh, and so the, the theorem is that uh, this uh, this is true if and only if the Jacobian of the system, so the linearization of the system everywhere, okay, is negative definite in some metric, okay, and. So, in other words, originally we thought it's a little weird that we can deal only with the Jacobian because it's a nonlinear system, but it's not the Jacobian at the point, it's ja Jacobian everywhere, okay? So Jacobian everywhere is more or less has the same information as the, the entire function, right? It's just a different way of seeing it. Okay. So, uh, so th that's the definition and that's the theorem, right? Uh, so let's, let's maybe get a just a little more technical, right? So what does it mean? It's a metric. It means that there exists a transformation, an invertible transformation, such that theta transpose, theta is positive definite, that's the metric. And then there's something we call the generalized Jacobian, which is basically the Jacobian of the system computed in this metric. Okay. And so um, the um, so basically, and, and the proof, basically, at least the proof of the sufficient condition is extremely simple. It's just a few lines, basically. Uh, to, to, to some extent, it's kind of Riemann coming to the rescue of Lyapunov, right? Because basically what, what you do is a sort of Lyapunov proof for differential displacements, and then you take a path integral at fixed time. Of uh, You compute the length of a path, and the length of a path shrinks exponentially because every little element shrinks exponentially. Uh, the style of doing things with contraction is a little different from the usual style in the sense that you don't have to play with an error signal. Okay, so for instance, you don't have to, you can, but so consider for instance the Lorentz attractor, which is definitely not a contracting system, but suppose you're trying to build an observer for the system, in other words, something that would measure for instance x and would reconstruct the other two states y and z. All right? Suppose you're very lazy, so you just copy the two last two equations putting hats on y and z to mean the hats of the estimates that the observer generates, okay? So suppose this, these are just the two last two equations copied. 
So what can we say about this observer? Well, if we pick an identity metric, in other words, we just look at the Jacobian, is Jacobian is this, right? So x is a function of time, of course, but is Jacobian is this is obviously negative definite because, uh, you know, once you take the symmetric part, you just get these two, this the diagonal, right? So in other words, this system is contracting with a rate, which is the minimum of one and beta, okay? And, sorry, and of course it has, whoops, of course, it has two particular solutions. One is, uh, one is the real system, because it was a copy of the real system. So the real system is a particular solution. And uh, uh, th this, uh, this system, therefore, uh, converges to uh, the real system with a rate which is the minimum of one and beta, right? Because it's, it's a system, it's a contracting system, so any two solutions converge to one another. We know one solution, namely the real system, so this system exponentially converges to that solution. Okay, so it's a one line, if you want, it's a one line proof, right? And it has no error signal, right? It has just the fact that the observer is contracting and you know a particular solution, all right? Uh, so, as advertised, these contracting systems, if you consider them, as, consider them as Lego block, have very nice aggregation properties. So if you take positive par parallel combinations with uh, positive coefficients, negative feedback, series and cascades, hierarchies, translation and scaling, wave look like, and all of the above, uh, they preserve contraction. Okay. So in other words, once you have the contraction properties of the building blocks, the dynamical building blocks, then you can combine them in pretty much any way you want using simple rules and automatically the entire system will be contracting and therefore will verify the property that any two, two solutions tend exponentially to each other. Okay. And at, at that time we, we, we said, well, you know, maybe nature is using this idea too because you know, it certainly helps if you take two things at work and connect them, but at least the result is at least stable. Okay. And so we said, well, you know, it's, a, it's a probably a good, uh, a good idea for, for modeling you know, a natural object, at least beyond a certain scale, to have this, uh, this property. We didn't call it that way because that hadn't yet, it's a word that didn't, uh, hadn't been invented, but it's an instance of what's now called evolvability. Okay? So in other words, the notion that, you know, there may be certain things that are done by biology to, uh, to make evolution easier. Okay? And that could be one of those. Okay. So I, I'll skip the, the, the proof, but the, the proofs are very simple of these combination properties. Okay. So for instance, if you take the, the hierarchies, you have this notion of composite variable, uh, which is uh, you can, uh, if you have, let's say, a second order system and you use a composite variable, which is a weighted sum of position and velocity, and you control now that variable, you reduce the order of the, the problem, but you have an equivalent problem and that corresponds to creating a hierarchy of contracting systems. Motor primitives in robotics or in frogs, you know, again, if, you, if, the, if the basic motor primitive is contracting, then any combination of these motor primitives with time varying coefficients would be contracting. Uh, entrainment, if you take a contracting system which is driven by a function of a vector of time which is periodic in time, then the system will tend towards a periodic state in time, robustness result and so on. Uh, you can have alternate norms versions, so this is with the Euclidean norm, but you could have uh, different but equivalent criteria with the Z norm and the uh, infinity norm, which would have to do with uh, diagonal dominance. Suppose you have a network of um, network of dynamic systems, you can, using a very standard result, replace this network by a directed acyclic graph of strongly connected components, okay? Uh, you this is a completely, uh, you know, standard algorithm to take a big network and make it look more like this, right? Like a cascade of strongly connected components. Since hierarchies of contracting systems are contracting, then if each of these strongly connected components is contracting, so is the entire result, okay? And they could all be contracting in different met metrics and so on. Uh, getting back to this biology and evolvability, right, uh, there was this paper, completely independent work, of course, by uh, Gerhardt and uh, Gershner uh, later on in 2007, which talked about facilitated variation. And the idea that, these are biologists, uh, real biologists, uh, with the idea that uh, 
uh, in a sense, you have core processes which are highly conserved in evolution, things like uh, DNA transcription, you know, uh, or DNA replication, things like uh, sexual reproduction and so on. These are very, there are core processes that you see in lots of animals and so on. And that evolution is mostly targeting the way you combine these core processes, okay? So in terms of philosophies, this is very close to what we're saying, because if we say, well, you know, you have these kind of core dynamic systems, and then you can combine them any way you want, and you will still have a contracting dynamic system, and you can play with the combinations to, uh, to get uh, functionality that you want. Similarly, uh, people like Uri Alon have been looking at the fact that if you look at networks uh, in, uh, in biology, you don't find random networks, but you see some very specific what's so-called network motifs. And so, for instance, he, he, the, their group found those uh, in, uh, in a number of, uh, of natural networks. And if you wonder what these network motifs correspond to, what you can show... Now, of course, the motif in the networks behaves differently from the motif by itself, so in studying the motif by itself is not particularly uh, helpful. But what you can show is that these specific motifs are precisely the ones which preserve contraction best. Okay, so in other words, which given the stability, the stability properties of the elements, uh, optimize the stability properties of the result. Okay, so for instance, uh, if you plot the contraction gain or the contraction loss as compared to uh, the, the whether you're a motif or something uh, which, uh, which is something that you find very often or anti-motif which is something which you find very rarely you see a very strong correlation between finding a, a, mot a motif often and having a minimal contraction loss as you uh, combine these things. Uh, similarly if you have uh, time delays you can under very simple conditions say that if you have two contracting systems <laughs> Uh, there are specific kinds of coupling uh, which preserve contraction under the time delay. Uh, and these couplings have to do with the metric. Okay? So, so for instance, if you take two linear stable systems, which are obviously contracting, if you couple them with using what's called a PD controller, namely a controller which has something proportional to the position error and something proportional to the velocity error, <laughs> this is not contracting in the right metric, and as a result, the system will be unstable. If, however, you just use a D controller, something just proportional to the error in velocities, then that's contracting in the right metric, and therefore the error will be stable. Okay. And so you, you can therefore take these systems, and based on their contraction properties, this gives you constraint on the architecture to make sure that the overall system is contracting. Okay. And you can see that in this kind of more general diagram that by now you see all the time today, right? Uh, with feedback, okay. oops, with feedback, uh, and with uh, mics, this works. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you can see that this basically this result tells you if when you when you have this kind of predictive feedback hierarchies, right, the f feed forward and then feedback, uh, stability uh, um, St stability demands, if you want, on the overall system, specify some very ca specific kinds of connections if you want to be, uh, if you want to be um, uh, stable in the presence of delays. Okay. Now, these questions uh, related to uh, Jan's talk yesterday turned out to apply directly to, to questions of optimization, continuous time optimization, because if you think that, if you think about uh, this condition that the generalized Jacobian is negative definite, you can equivalently write it as this matrix condition on the metric, okay? And this matrix condition on the metric, as we said, implies that any two trajectories will tend exponentially to each other. Uh, more technically, it says that the length of any geodesic with respect to this metric will decrease exponentially at rate alpha, okay? Now, if you think of the, the most simple gradient descent, of course, if you take a gradient descent and you take its Jacobian, you find the Hessian, right? So this gradient descent is going to be contracting if the Hessian uh, is positive uh, definite, right? And, uh, the, and the, uh, the minimum eigenvalue of the, the Hessian will tell you the contraction rate, okay? So that's fairly obvious. Uh, if you just take a gradient and you take the, the, the Jacobian, you get the Hessian and you don't need a metric, just an identity metric, okay? What's a little more fun, which in a sense 
was floating around in the when we thought about contraction that we never said it explicitly so uh, is that this is really uh, directly related or directly applicable to all of what you can say about natural gradient okay uh, so suppose that you think about the natural gradient very much uh, kind of continuous time versions of what Ian showed us uh, two days ago right so uh, x dot equal the inverse of a metric times the Euclidean gradient Okay, so the natural gradient direction is the direction of steepest descent, right? According to distances measured on the space equipped with a Riemannian metric, all right? And so that's, that's the, the gradient in that steepest direction, right? And uh, as you know, a function is, uh, is uh, alpha g convex. If it's alpha convex in the, the length parameter along any geodesic curve, or equivalently, if it's Hessian, what's called the geodesic Hessian, is larger than alpha times m, where the geodesic Hessian is based on the Euclidean Hessian plus some Christoffel terms. Okay, so the point is, uh, if you take this natural gradient descent, okay, then a function is going to be strong alpha strongly g convex in the metric m, if and only if its natural gradient system is contracting at rate alpha in the same metric in the same metric, okay? So in other words, if you take your natural gradient, your natural gradient is contracting in the metric M, uh, uh, it is going to be contracting in the same metric M. And this comes from a, a very uh, obvious uh, just algebraic computation, uh, which actually, if, if you see it from a tensor point of view, is even more obvious, but le let's just uh, do the algebraic uh, version. Uh, the point is that this matrix here that you're trying to make negative definite for the system to be contracting is precisely uh, minus two times the geodesic Hessian. All right. So, uh, in other words, the geodesic Hessian is one to one related to this contraction property. Okay. It's one to one related to this contraction property. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, the, uh, the, the natural gradient uh, will be contracting in this, uh, in this same uh, metric. You can apply this also to the non-strict contraction case, so in the case where you know, it's not uh, strict uh, convexity, you may have lots of local minima and so on, so there's lots of results known about this from Rapsack and all, but the, nice, the fun thing is that you can prove uh, all these results purely from a um, dynamics point of way, okay? a uh, very simple dynamics point of view. So for instance, if the natural gradient dynamics of F are semi-contracting in a certain metric F, M, then F is G convex, and every stationary point of F is a global optimum. And every, any geodesic between two optima is composed of global optima. Okay. And so that's a property of uh, geodesically convex functions, but it's also something that you can prove very easily using these dynamic tools, right? Simply by taking two uh, two equilibria of the system and a path between these two equilibria initializing the path any way you want okay and basically the flow of this path the the how this path transforms through the flow of the system will tell you immediately that f of x1 will tend towards f of x2 okay and therefore the value of these equilibria will be the same and therefore if one is uh, they, they will all be global because there's one global equilibrium somewhere so, uh, and you can prove that uh, very easily using these dynamic tools as well. Similarly, you can play with, uh, I won't get into the details of that, especially because I'm running a lot of time, but uh, the, uh, you can play with tools like the Bregman divergence or its specialization to the KL divergence in the, KL of, in the case of probability distributions or in the case of uh, positive definite matrices. And you can prove all sorts of, uh, so typically the, the Bregman divergence is convex in the, f in the first argument, but not necessarily in the second. And you can show using simple dynamic, these simple dynamic system tools when it is geodesically convex in the second, okay, simply by playing these games we just did, okay. So for instance, the discrete KL divergence is G convex in Q. And similarly, uh, this is going to be G convex in, in the matrix Q. <coughs> okay. So uh, basically, you, you can use, in a sense, use this formula here, which is just a pure algebraic formula, uh, to uh, 
to derive, if you want, all these questions of complexity and, uh, and uh, quasi-convexity and uh, partial convexity and so on, purely from a dynamic system point of view. Now, the other thing is that this formula is also true if everything but the metric depends on time. Okay? So in other words, it applies to non-autonomous systems as well. Okay? So it says all these combination properties we explained about contracting systems, uh, negative feedback, hierarchies, and so on, apply immediately to these natural gradient systems okay? in any metric. Okay? So for instance, you can have a hierarchical natural gradient when you have a natural gradient with a metric M1 and a completely different uh, state and dimension with a natural gradient of a metric M2, then this overall system, uh, assuming each of them is strongly G-convex, the overall system uh, will be globally exponentially contracting. Okay? And that's, of course, that's backprop. Okay? That's backprop, but except it's backprop in a concurrent backprop. Basically, you have a series of gra gradients or natural gradient, but they all occur at the same time. Okay? And you show that the entire thing is contracting uh, with a rate which you know explicitly from the contraction analysis, okay? which is actually, in this case, the, the slowest rate of the the rate of the slowest subsystem. Okay? And of course, there's nothing special about two systems. You could have 10 systems or 200, as, uh, as we were shown the first day. Okay? Uh, similarly, if you do uh, negative feedback between two gradient systems, so for instance, you could have something like that in adversarial learning, when you have very much kind of a game theory kind of uh, setup. Okay? Um, then, uh, if you have negative feedback between these multiplier gains, then uh, assuming that F1 is strongly G-convex in, uh, uh, in X1 and F2 is strongly G-convex in X2, uh, uh, and you have this negative feedback, then you're going to converge to a unique Nash equilibrium. Okay. So you're going to converge, basically. So, so this could be, in principle, applied to these uh, adversarial settings and so on. And incidentally, you know, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in, uh, in Ian's talk on, uh, on Monday, you know, that also suggested very specific kinds of natural gradients and metric, um, like these Poincaré spheres and things like that, right? Uh, which, you know, would apply directly here as well. Okay. Uh, similarly, if you have primal dual kind of optimizations, you know, that's very similar to the negative feedback. If you have primal dual kinds of optimization, uh, then uh, you can do geodesic primal dual, right, by putting metrics, uh, metrics inverses in the, in the computation. And uh, basically, uh, you can uh, give very simple conditions. Uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, the, the Lagrangian is G-convex over X and G-concave over lambda, then this entire thing will be contracting uh, with a metric diagonal of MX, MX lam and M lambda, okay? And these are all like two-line proofs, okay? Uh, so you can play very easily with these primal dual optimization and so on using these uh, metric tools. Now, so this is related to your question. Here we're talking about contraction. Okay, any two trajectories end up doing the same thing. In particular, if the system is autonomous, is not time varying, uh, then it, it would mean that they tend toward uh, an equilibrium. In general, they tend toward a unique trajectory. Now, how about things like synchronization? Um, so, uh, how do you deal with oscillators? Or how do you deal basically with doing multiple optimizations in parallel and sharing their results? Okay. So, the basic idea, or at least in our context, is what we call partial contraction. So, suppose, for instance, you have two systems, let's say two oscillators, and you want to show that they synchronize if you couple them in a certain way. Neither of the oscillator is contracting because, you know, once in its limit cycle, you know, they don't catch up on the limit cycle. But you can show that they synchronize if you can exhibit a third system of mathematical system which is contracting and has these two oscillators as particular solutions. All right? So, uh, and similarly, if you have a system which, is, uh, con uh, which uh, you want to show is, uh, that the solution tends, let's say, to zero, you can also play with a virtual system this way. So, For instance, since we were just talking about uh, the optimization setting, suppose you have a natural gradient but with a time-varying and state-dependent learning rate p, right? So when does this work? Well, you can build this virtual system, this is mathematical system, which is minus p of xt times m inverse of y, 
and the uh, gradient of f of y. Okay? So think of it, the system, okay? It's Jacobian. Uh, it's the basically the usual Jacobian if you didn't have p, because for this system, the Jacobian is mul just multiplied by p of xt, right? It's just an external thing. And therefore, this system is contracting, okay? But of course, it contains x and the minimum of f as particular solutions, and therefore, x tends exponentially towards the minimum of f. Right? But you see the subtlety here is that we didn't take the Jacobian of this system because it would have been a mess. We took the Jacobian of this virtual system, which is basically the usual Jacobian times p of xt. All right? And so uh, this shows that um, if f is alpha strongly g convex in m, then this system converges exponentially to the minimum of f with rate alpha times the minimum of p. Right? Similarly, in uh, biology, uh, this, this is, has a long history. Uh, Bonnie Bassler is extremely active in this field at the moment, and many other biologists. Uh, there's this idea of quorum sensing, but we could also think about it from the point of view of optimization. So the idea of quorum sensing is saying, you know, a, a bacterium, assuming it's a bad bacterium, by itself doesn't have much of a chance to uh, do anything to its host, okay? So to do things to its host, it multiplies, okay? It grows. And at some point, there's enough bacteria so that indeed they have a chance to overpower the immune system. So they switch on different behaviors and in coordination try to attack the host. Okay. The question is how do they know how many how do they know how many they are? Okay. How do they know that they are there's enough bacterial to have a chance to attack the immune system? Okay. So suppose we start, so let's have a simplified version of this. Suppose we start with a a number of dynamic systems uh, not necessarily contracting, and we couple them all to all, okay? Uh, this is equivalent, this is just algebra, this is equivalent to creating a common uh, quantity sum of xj and s from each of the xj's and feeding it back to everybody, okay? So in other words, if you're trying to create an all to all connection that's of the order n square, but actually, you can create it by creating a common signal and feeding it back to everyone, and it's of order n. And it's the same thing. You haven't lost anything. Okay? And that's exactly what the bacteria do, right? They put in the environment a chemical, which is called an autoinducer, and they measure the total amount of that chemical. All right? And this way, they know how many they are, and this way, this becomes a synchronization mechanism, and this way, it's exactly equivalent to all-to-all -all coupling. Okay. Now, how do we show under which condition these systems synchronize? Well, these are the real system, I equal 1 to n. We pick a virtual system of the same dimension as one of the system, y dot equal f of yt minus kn y, n is the number of systems, k is the gain, plus this k sum of xi, right? And we see immediately that if we look at the Jacobian of a system in an identity metric, this disappears when you take the Jacobian. And you just get the Jacobian of f minus k times n times identity. All right? And therefore, this system is contracting if kn is large enough. Meaning either if the gain is large enough, for instance, you know, the, the environment is confined enough, okay? or you, you have let them more time to multiply. Okay? So this is contracting if kn is large enough. As soon as this becomes contracting, you're guaranteed that all the individual elements, which happen to be particular trajectories of your contracting system, will synchronize towards one another. Okay? Because they all happen to be then particular trajectories of this virtual contracting system. Okay? And of course, you can use exactly the same thing in optimization if you're trying to, uh, if you use uh, uh, many. Uh, uh, gradient systems or natural gradient systems, and you, you're creating this common variable and sending it back to everybody else, uh, then you uh, immediately have an algorithm which in order n creates all to all coupling and guarantees you're synchronized above a threshold threshold. Okay? And just for fun, because uh, it has been a long day, uh, I can just uh, show you, was it Google or was it, uh, I don't remember if it was Google, was it? Oh, let's try this. Yeah, I can show you something we did about 10 years ago with Patrick Béchon and uh, Anal Desbaran. Uh, this, is a, this is kind of silly, but it's just uh, so, not silly, but uh, it was really a toy thing we did very, very quickly. It's, uh, so we had a bunch of now robots, you know, when they had taught them to dance, right? 
and then you push one of them on the floor and it has to get back up and get back in sync. Okay. And so we did that, uh, that was about 10 years ago, we did exactly this quorum sensing thing, right? Where the server served at, well, was used as the quorum variable. You know, they all send their positions to the server and send them back uh, to everybody else. And so this is what it uh, looks like, okay? Without the music. So this is Patrick. Uh, so you, you put one of them down, okay, gently. Uh, and so the other ones are still synchronized with the quorum sensing, okay? And then, you know, it catches up with what everybody else is doing, okay? And of course, the, the demo is nicer when you have like a thousand, because, you know, the point is that they still all synchronize even the upper disturbances and so on. It's a feedback system, right? So it's very robust, and they still all synchronize. Uh, but uh, you can, um, uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, and this is just, this is just, uh, this is the entire uh, math, right? So it's again, a one line uh, kind of proof. Okay. okay. So these oscillator synchronizations have, have a bunch of uh, non-intuitive properties and, uh, and I'll skip uh, some of them because of uh, time. But, you know, of course, one of them is that you can get global synchronization from local interactions, okay? Uh, one of them is that you have this leader following property, which you can show, which is, you know, suppose you take a million, let's say, oscillators, but perhaps optimizers, okay? And you couple them, perhaps locally, so that they get global synchronization or through a quorum sensing mechanism. And suppose you drop in there a guy uh, who is just like the others, sends information to locally to the others, or, or perhaps to a quorum variable, okay? Sends information just to the others, but doesn't get any feedback, okay? So this subsystem, so you have your million oscillators, and you add one oscillator, which connect to the others, locally perhaps, but doesn't get any feedback. What can you show? Well, you can show that everybody still synchronizes, but of course, since he couldn't care less about the others, they synchronize to him, all right? So in other words, you could have these million oscillators and you have a million and one oscillator, very small change in the system, and suddenly the phase of everybody becomes his, okay? In the Bush era, and probably even worse today, it's just be called the leader, okay? It's, uh, it's, the, it's the system that doesn't listen to the others, but everybody has to follow, okay? So, and you see, you have just this one system, very sparse change, and because everybody's still synchronized, they have to synchronize to him. The same math show that if you have, let's say, a million oscillators and all globally synchronized, say, wait a minute, I don't like the synchronization because that happens to be called epilepsy, okay? Or that happens to be called problems of the power system or something like that. You know, I want to get rid of this oscillation. What can I do? Well, you can take your million oscillators and w take two of them at random at one inhibitory connection. In other words, one connection just like the others, but with a minus sign between these two oscillators and everybody will stop. And the reason is that before you had a virtual system which was contracting and by adding this connection, the real system now is contracting and the real system being autonomous in that case, it tends towards an equilibrium point, okay? And so you can show this it's a, it's a little, that's why I was saying non-intuitive, right? It's a, oops, why is this? Uh, it's, a, it's a little uh, uh, non-intuitive. Uh, the, uh, you know, this is uh, an example of Fitsu Nagumo oscillator. So it's a simple model of a Hodgkin Huxley oscillator. We take one variable, okay? We plot one variable. Uh, I think it was a thousand oscillators. So they synchronize very quickly from original initial conditions. You put this one inhibitory connection, they stop. You remove this connection they resynchronize, okay? So in other words, the synchronization is very robust to changes in parameters, and we'll come back to that if we have time, but it's very fragile to change in topology, right? Just adding this one inhibitory connection changes completely the behavior, okay? And, you know, from a, a, from a philosophical point of view, think of what we said before about the thalamus and so on. We were saying, you know, you have a system which works, you know, but the data is very small, very sparse change in the data 
change uh, a lot the behavior. And here we're showing very sparse change in either the input in the case of a leader, which is like the data, right, or in the topology of the connections will completely change the behavior of the system. All right. Um, now, of course, uh, when we talk about synchronization, it applies as well to, as I said, optimization. For instance, if you have a, uh, a system of multiple equilibria, synchronization means they'll always vote for the, the same equilibrium, right? Uh, and you have all the, if you want all the algebra, and again, uh, I skipped some of the algebra, but it's just a few lines. All the algebra is very, very simple, okay? Because it's basically just uh, basic algebra on positive definite matrices, okay? So, uh, so I'm not sure I have time to talk about it. I'll, I'll skip this. Fifteen minutes. Okay. Uh, what? A quick question. Yeah. So maybe I'll, l l let's say uh, anybody knows what that is. Okay, fine. Uh, so this is from the right of spring. Okay, fine. Uh, the point is maybe I'll just show you briefly at least this. Right. Suppose you have three similar systems which you're trying to synchronize. It's very easy to do it with a common leader-like system, and it's not a question of symmetry. Because, for instance, if you have a feedback from one system to back to this, uh, they will still synchronize, the yellow things will still synchronize because we still get a common input from this center. Okay, so it's not a question of symmetry, it's a question of what's called input equivalence. Okay, there's lots of work done by Golubitsky and, and people like that on, on the earlier, uh, uh, earlier inspirations of that idea. Okay. So uh, the uh, so it's it's input equivalence and the yellow things will synchronize. Now suppose you take the yellow things and connect them to green things, completely different dimensions and uh, dynamics and so on. Okay, now you see that because the yellow things synchronize, the green things now they will serve as a common input to the green things. Okay, and therefore the green things which are far away in the system will globally, exponentially, robustly synchronize without ever talking to each other. Okay and going through completely different dynamics, right? Again, this could be dimension uh, 10, and this could be dimension 2000, and completely different dynamics. Okay. And you can change a lot of things about the system, which will still be true. Okay, this will still be true, but all the yellow things synchronize, and all the green things synchronize. And of course, there's nothing spe special about two variables, two colors, you could have 10 colors, right? And this was originally motivated for us by this question of binding in the brain. The fact that as you s listen to somebody giving a talk, you know, some parts of your brain process visual information and some parts of your brain process sound and so on. And the visual information itself divided into edges and, uh, and, uh, and colors and so on. And similarly for the sounds and uh, onsets and so on. But uh, all of these co computations are done at different parts in your cortex and you don't have, you're not conscious of them, but you have to time them. You have to know that these different parts are bound, okay? You have to know that these different parts are talking about the same time instant, okay? And that would suggest a mechanism to, to do that, okay? And from a contraction point of view, it's just instead of talking to, uh, instead of tending towards, um, instead of tending towards a unique uh, trajectory, you tend now towards a linear subspace, and since I won't have time to talk about it, you could do the same thing talking to, tending towards a manifold. Uh, and so you'll have very simple conditions based on Jacobians and you'll have the same combination properties. Okay. So I'll skip the, the details of that just to say that it's robust convergence to a subspace. Okay, and therefore, if you put small errors in the dynamics, instead of converging to a subspace, you'll converge to some boundary layer around the subspace. This may be one of the reasons why nature is using spikes, okay, action potentials, okay? There's lots of good reasons to use spikes, you're mixing uh, continuous and discrete co computation, things like that. But also, from the point of view of timing, okay, suppose this uh, cartoon is actually the, the spi two spikes for two systems just on top of each other, okay? So we're just synchronized, okay? Suppose you move the parameters of one system, so now they desynchronize. Right? Originally we were synchronized, you, you mess up with one system, they desynchronize. Okay? You see that if you're using spikes, desynchronization means a huge error on the trajectory, right? Because these are spikes, these are very big and then zero. Okay? But from the, what this robustness result says, it says that a huge error on the trajectory can only be explained by a huge error on the parameters. Okay? And therefore, if you take, let's say, and you can do this on, on MATLAB any way you want, right? If you take two models of spiking oscillators, which synchronize, and you mess up 
the parameters of them, one of them by 60%, they still synchronize exactly at the same place. Because this robustness result says that spiking gives you enormous robustness of timing with respect to parameter variation, because you would need huge parameter variation to, uh, to justify these huge errors created by spikes which do not synchronize. And actually, that's a numerical example, uh, which I think is like if 80% parameter change, and they still spike at exactly the same time. Now, remember, I talked about these kinds of uh, I talked about these kinds of uh, of uh, predictive uh, feedback hierarchies. You can uh, do them also. These were with contracting systems, but you can al also do them with uh, with oscillators. Okay, uh, so uh, in a sense, you you have very simple properties that tell you when when you have a system like this compo composed not of just basic dynamic system, but of spiking oscillators when the overall system will be this big synchronized spiking system. Uh, all right. So I have how much time? Eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. So, so, uh, so just, just to say that synchronization protects from noise, okay? And uh, you can uh, compute that explicitly, okay? So in other words, uh, you can show that uh, if you have a... Uh, Let's say if you have this is uh, the output of one oscillator, and if you drive this one oscillator with a lot of noise, then this becomes this output. Okay. Now suppose then that you instead of putting one oscillator, you pick ten oscillators, and you couple them so that in the absence of noise they would synchronize. Then this is what you get. In other words, the red. <laughs> okay. So in other words, the fact that you've coupled them so that they synchronize give you the same noise averaging behavior in these completely nonlinear systems that you would have in a linear system, right? In the nonlinear system, in general, you don't have noise averaging, right? But uh, input noise averaging, but the synchronization gives you that, okay? So another way to, to see this is that if you take uh, the, uh, the, the pure system and you look at the mean, you get this green, uh, green uh, curve. If you look at the mean when each of them has a lot of independent noise, you get this curve, which has nothing to do with anything. It, it looks clean, because it, uh, but the, it doesn't have to do anything with the signal. But if you take the red curve, which is when the systems are synchronized so that they would exactly synchronize in the absence of noise, then basically you recover the noise averaging properties of linear systems in these completely nonlinear oscillators driven by input noise. You can play with multiple time scale optimization very easily. I don't have time to talk about it, but basically you can use these ideas of a combination of contracting systems and so on to give very simple conditions when you have multiple time scale systems like this, which depend on an upper and a lower level. When, when is it sufficient that each of the system is contracting by, uh, by considering the other two as external variables, okay? When is it sufficient that these, each of the system is contracting for the overall system to be contracting? Okay, uh, I'll completely skip of that. So you can have applications to uh, putting uh, together uh, neuromorphic chips, uh, uh, robotic turtles, uh, micro satellites on the space station, computer graphics, um, motor primitives in, uh, in robots, uh, distributed adaptation, um, SLAM. I won't have time to talk about and. And I won't have to talk about albatross, but I'll be happy to answer questions. And uh, last point, uh, you know, once you know how to play with stability, and I think we have, at least for reasonably smooth systems and so on, a, a very uh, a rather general and comparatively simple way to play with stability of nonlinear systems, you can play a lot of games with controlled instability, okay? Uh, so, for instance, you may wonder, you know, suppose I'm trying to go solve a graph coloring problem, you know, uh, under which condition is the most uh, basic idea, which is uh, to just take winner take all and have them fight with each other, under which condition will this work? And, and you can show under which condition it actually works quite generally. Uh, and I won't have time to talk about this except to say that you can play with notions of controllability of networks, which is directly kind of graph notions. And you can play also with notions of observability. And if we think about this idea of facilitated variation, this notion that um, 
you have core processes uh, built up by evolution and that evolution then targets mostly how you put them together, then you see that understanding this from a mathematical point of view, at least <coughs> loosely understanding this or uh, having a nice analogy if you want from a mathematical point of view, involves both these tools of contraction and what does it mean to choose the connections. And con the choosing the connections is not controllability of nodes, but it's controllability of links, okay? Which is, you know, we, we had this nature paper on the controllability of, uh, of systems, which had to do with node controllability. But if actually you do link controllability, which is work that uh, Vicek and his, uh, his colleague did, then actually low, no, low link controllability is the tool you need to be able to describe, you know, how are you going to pick the right connections to get uh, whatever uh, extra complexity you want. So I'll, I'll move around anyway, I'll be happy to answer questions and most of the papers are here and of course this is work with lots of students uh, uh, which are all of these papers. Yeah. So in uh, aeronautics and control theory in yeah. general, yeah. Um, you know, airplane designers uh, try to make airplanes uh, stable, but as unstable as possible because uh, the least stable they are, the more controllable they are, right? The the more the, the most maneuvering. So so yeah, f f yeah. So, so f thanks for asking. So so yeah. So. The control of stability. So the, the example of airplane, you know, uh, not when you take a jumbo jet, when you take an A380 is not clear, but when you take a military aircraft, right, the center of mass is very close to the center of lift. So it basically is the, 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 uh, the plane is either unstable or very close to being unstable. And basically you rely a lot on the control system, you rely entirely on the control system. To, to make it work. Again, the idea is that basically when a military aircraft uh, wants to, to make a maneuver, you basically throw it into instability and then you catch it. Yeah? You don't want to do that with a passenger jet, but you do that in military aircraft. Okay? Actually, actually, they do this with uh, passenger, passenger jets since the uh, Airbus 320. Yeah, yeah, well, to, to some extent, yeah, but uh, you don't throw them still, you know, but, but yeah, yeah, the, that's definitely the A380 is, uh, is very close to that, okay? Uh, you know, if you think of, of a 747, you know, the nose was in front to have uh, the center of mass very much in front of the center of lift and of course it got stretched and stretched and st stretched and the A380 is two decks, right? So the nose is nowhere, right? Uh, so control instability, you can have the path of least resistance also, you know, uh, lots of people are playing now with uh, robotics and deep learning to open doors, right? Uh, with robots, but opening a door with a robot is a one degree of freedom thing, okay? Or maybe a two degree if there's a handle and then you open the door. And so that actually can be done purely with one line of code because basically you're just trying to create an instability and the system will by itself find in which direction it can move. Okay. Uh, so that's another example of control instability. Uh, this constraint satisfaction I just gave, you know, is another. And, uh, and if you think of it, you know, expansion and pruning, right? This uh, million new connections per second, I was saying is just, uh, is just if you do a, a scaling, right? But actually it's much more complicated than that because not only you have connections which are created, that's the ins unstable process, but you have lots of connections which are pruned, okay? And so you have the interaction between the two. But so, yes, so instability, I think, is a, is a major mechanism uh, used in aircraft, but still grossly underused, I think, in general, and particularly in robotics. So, uh, again, one last uh, question. Yeah. Oh, last question. Um, <coughs> if I listen to your talk, can you then explain with your theory of contraction what is the success of deep learning strategies? Is that coupled to that? Okay, so that's what we're trying to understand. So success, uh, so first of all, uh, you know, uh, so, so, so first of all, you have to realize, you know, that's why I was pointing at 20 watts and, uh, you know, so, so uh, uh, we're still very far from the brain and we're still very far from, uh, you know, from a theoretical point of view, right? Uh, we're still very far from uh, the couple of examples uh, a child needs to learn what a lion is as opposed to the millions of examples that uh, a, a deep learning system might, okay? But in a sense, it's saying, okay, so, uh, so you have... Um, you have these tools which can deal with, of course, convex optimization. Deep learning is not convex, but more generally, G-convex optimization, which is more general. You also so know that, so I'm not saying, uh, by, by the end of this answer, you won't know the answer, I'm just trying to hear. Uh, but uh, I, uh, you also know that stochastic gradients is a form of filtering, 
uh, spatial filtering. And so, you know, in a sense, if you take a function which is rather messy and spatially filtered, it's going to be much easier to get to a good minimum. Uh, they starting actually, I think, to do in, uh, in deep learning what exactly what we did in quorum sensing before, okay, which is to try to coordinate uh, these different uh, algorithms and so on, okay. So I'm just saying, you know, uh, you know, and of course Amari and so on have worked has worked a lot on just uh, you know uh, optimization, uh, natural gradient uh, optimization for learning and so on. So I'm just saying having these really comparatively quite simple mathematical tools to, to do all of this, I think should should help a lot. Okay, and that's uh, and especially this mapping between just natural gradient and contraction, you know, allowing you to use all the tools from contraction, all the combination properties, all the synchronization properties, and so on, absolutely for free. You know, uh, I suspect that should uh, that should help. Thank you.